Welcome to Climate Fix Podcast. Here we dive into evidence-based solutions to climate change and various other pressing environmental issues. This podcast is created by Americans for Nuclear Energy, a pro-nuclear environmental organization. We take no money from industry or special interest groups. All donations are from individuals like you, interested in a grassroots scientific movement to solve the world's most pressing scientific problem, global climate change. We hope you approach these ideas with humanism and an open mind. Our mission statement is as follows. Nuclear energy is safe, cheap, plentiful, clean, and efficient. It has the capability to stop and reverse climate change while addressing the ever-growing demand for electricity globally. We strive to educate American citizens about this technology and to dispel misconceptions with facts. We firmly believe that both human civilization and industrialism can easily coexist with a healthy environment. Join us in helping to plan a prescription for a feverish planet, or as we like to say, a climate fix. This is your host, Phil Ord. And this is your co-host, Colby Kirk. The name of this episode is A Doctor's Case for Nuclear Power. We have the privilege to talk to Dr. Chris Kiefer, an emergency department physician and medical simulation specialist who is an activist for clean air and climate action, which led him to be very passionate about the benefits of nuclear power. To help out with the cause of clean nuclear power, he is the president of Canadians for Nuclear Energy and the co-founder and director of Doctors for Nuclear Energy. Chris is also an avid podcaster and hosts the Decouple podcast and the We Can Do It podcast, named after the Canadian Can Do Reactor. Many of us know the climate benefits of a switch to nuclear power, but along with that comes very positive downstream effects on human health. Because of nuclear producing no particulate and gaseous pollution, it can massively decrease the estimated 7 million global deaths from air pollution every year. Nuclear science is also heavily used in medicine for diagnostic purposes and treatment of disease that we could not live without in today's society. The truth is simple. Nuclear physics and harnessing the incredible power of the atom has helped humanity much more than it has hurt us. It is so great to see people with such high levels of scientific training advocating for nuclear power, even if it is outside their immediate field. The opinion of medical doctors is especially valuable as they see firsthand the major health issues affecting humankind. It is important to remember how the choice of technologies we use carry moral implications on the well-being of our species and we should always strive to lessen human suffering with all that we do. If we look at the data and the evidence, the benefits of nuclear power on health are overwhelming. It offers us all the energy we want with the lowest rate of death or injury. It produces no harmful waste that enters the biosphere. Also, it produces absolutely no air pollution with the least amount of material extraction per unit of energy. We hope that the work Chris is doing will bring more and more practitioners of health to support such an important technology and field of science. Absolutely. Energy production may seem distant and unrelatable for many people, but the externalities of pollution have tremendous impact on our health. Doctors have played a role in shaping public health policy with clean air quality standards. So we hope to see further involvement in pushing for the technologies that can actually deliver and guarantee cleaner air. Here is our conversation with Dr. Chris Kiefer. Hey, Chris, thanks for coming on. Hey, it's my pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So, Chris, you're the founder and director of the organization Doctors for Nuclear Energy. What brought you to start the organization and what are its goals? Uh, you know, there's a... There's generally a, an opinion amongst uh, physicians that tends towards anti-nuclearism, um, certainly in terms of how physicians have uh, organized themselves with activism. So, you know, there's two large organizations, uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility and the uh, and International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which uh, sprang up out of, you know, concerns about basically a nuclear annihilation through through nuclear weapons um, and trying to find ways to pressure governments to um, you know a stop nuclear weapons testing and b um, you know abolish nuclear weapons altogether and these groups have tended to sort of bleed into anti-nuclear energy um, activism and so i felt that there was a real need to uh, shift the overton window a little bit and show that there are uh, physicians out there in the world uh, who see the benefits of nuclear energy, uh, particularly as a tool to um, combat air pollution, 
but beyond that, with the um, you know growing climate uh, crisis that we face, um, you know, there's many physicians who have become concerned about that, and uh, you know, are advocating around those issues. And and of course, that's an issue that uh, is a prominent selling point of of nuclear energy. You know, amongst amongst physicians, um, you know, in our in our education, we're we're taught about the social determinants of health. Right, so so the the kind of upstream causes of the illnesses that we see and treat in our clinics and hospitals every day, um, you know, and so those things uh, include you know things like poverty, for instance, um, and and certainly air pollution. So um, you know that's something that's drummed into us. And for those of us that kind of think more broadly than just our daily clinical practice um, and have more of an activist bent, that certainly motivates political activity. And so for me you know, what was congruent with uh, my values and, and what I'd been learning and studying over the last few years as I became increasingly concerned with climate change. Um, starting for starting Doctors for Nuclear Energy just felt like uh, a very necessary and important thing to do. It definitely does. It sounds like, you know, the current groups out there that uh, enlist doctors, uh, you know, if they sort of lean anti-nuclear, at least uh, visually, uh, it's important to really set yourself apart from those groups and, and make a good case for the energy side. I mean, I, th I think that's paralleled as well in the in the environmental movement, right? I mean, all of the uh, mainstream environmental organizations, I think, you know, up until the early 2000s um, were, were very anti-nuclear, with the exception of, you know, some of the early groups like the Sierra Club, which... Um, you know, started off actually quite pro-nuclear um, on environmental grounds because of the incredibly small um, land and material impacts of nuclear energy, say, compared to hydro dams. So, you know, yeah. early, the early, I think it was the early president of the Sierra Club was, was quite pro-nuclear on those grounds. Um, but, you know, in environmentalism, I'd say probably starting in the early 2000s, uh, folks like Stuart Brandt, um, and even James Lovelock uh, started to point out the environmental benefits of nuclear energy. And so that just started to sort of, again, broaden the Overton window, what was, um, you know, politically possible to advocate for. And, you know, I don't predominantly define myself as an environmentalist, although I have huge concerns about the environment, um, you know, and I want to, to problem solve those things. Um, but, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of rambling here a little bit. But, you know, it's just important, I think, to show that there is a diversity of opinion. And that diversity of opinion tends to kind of drive the anti-nuclear folks crazy because they're used to having kind of an utter dominance of the, uh, the discourse on these topics. Um, but I think it's, it's vitally important um, in order to navigate the challenges that we face to have this uh, certainly diversity of opinions and to start talking about science and evidence-based solutions. Um, and I think that's really where a lot of the anti-nuclearism falls flat um, is, is really... Um, being based in, in more emotional appeals than, um, than you know, a, a critical analysis of, of the evidence that's out there. Right. And I think it's also the idea that, you know, nuclear technology produces like unspeakable waste products, even though that's not really true at all. Uh, and it's just kind of the power for the course to say, you know, to consider nuclear like a, a polluting industry when the more you look into it, the more you realize it's just not. And, you know, uh, may I ask you uh, what got you originally uh, interested in nuclear uh, as a doctor in the first place? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember uh, I used to work in the Yukon Territory and I was uh, on vacation sort of visiting my stomping grounds. And, uh, you know, a, a guy I met up there, um, he was in the involved in uh, some of the kind of Arctic oil and gas industry. And uh, he went on a bit of a diatribe about how, uh, you know, anthropogenic climate change was uh, was all bullshit. And, uh, you know, I, I realized I didn't really have the um, the data at my fingertips to, to argue with him. And so that led me to uh, to start reading up on climate change. And I read books like, you know, The Sixth Mass Extinction and, and uh, Mark Linus's book, uh, Six Degrees of, of Climate Emergency, um, and started to synthesize a little bit of the uh, information, um, you know, from the IPCC and, and other scientists. And, uh, you know, that led me to be a bit of a doomer for some time. Um, but particularly uh, Mark Linus, who's one of the sort of founding fathers of eco-modernism um, and who famously changed his mind uh, as an environmentalist on genetic engineering and later on, on nuclear energy, 
um, started to to point me in a direction that um, you know was science based, that was based on on the scientific consensus. Because we have to remember that um, you know traditional environmentalists really respect the scientific consensus when it comes to climate change, right? Because there's a clear examples of people who have qualifications and PhDs and things like that who say that anthropogenic climate change doesn't exist, but they are a tiny minority of the scientific community. And it's very important to sort of put that in context because so many of these arguments, be they anti-nuclear, anti-vaccine, you can always find, you know, science that backs your, your cognitive biases, right? Um, mm -hmm. There will always be a few fringe scientists and contrarians who say that vaccines are, are bad or cause autism or, you know, who, um, who misrepresent um, the, the benefits of nuclear energy and, and the potential harms. Um, but they are in a, in, a, in a tiny fringe group. And so it's, it's very important that we as advocates, um, you know, don't fall into those traps. Um, but it's it's I think a real um, a real pattern within within the anti nuclear community um, to fall into um, avoiding the scientific consensus on things that are inconvenient um, that that cause them cognitive dissonance um, like like you know the con scientific consensus on the impacts of nuclear accidents um, you know and, and in other communities the scientific consensus around things like the benefit of vaccination. In your experience, uh, do doctors and other medical professionals maintain fears about radiation or nuclear power when it comes to public health effects? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you have to remember that if you look at a, a pie graph of um, exposure to radiation, like background radiation that, that we're all exposed to, right? The average is about uh, 2.7 millisieverts per year. Uh, doctors are responsible for uh, about 14% of that, right? So 15% of, of, uh, of, of uh, background radiation is artificial and medical radiation is 14% of that. Something like 95% of the artificial radiation we're exposed to. And again, that's not that there's any health difference between natural and artificial sources of radiation, but that compares to, you know, something like 0.2% is due to residual fallout from nuclear weapons testing, right? Um, so I think doctors have a real sense that, you know, we are administering, a, you know, <laughs> proportionately a large amount of, of artificial radiation and that there comes some responsibility with that. Um, certainly in our medical training, um, the linear no threshold hypothesis, which is this, um, you know, this model of um, uh, harms from radiation, which really defies everything we know about toxicity from any other um, potential um, mutagen or, or, or toxic agent, um, it's, uh, it's drummed into us in our, in our studies. So, you know, that gives us a basis to really fear that, you know, potentially we might be causing cancer, right? And so, you know, physicians swear a sacred vow to do no harm. Um, and I think that troubles a lot of physicians because there are studies in the literature um, which are highly flawed, um, which, uh, you know, you can read in certain ways that, that suggest that, you know, through medical imaging, you know, doctors may be causing you know, one cancer for every several thousand CTs that we order, for instance. And again, that's based largely off of linear no threshold assumptions, but that's that's kind of scary for a physician to, to think about. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely uh, that element within the physician community. On the flip side of that, though, I would say that particularly physicians that have been trained, you know, in the last 10 years um, and who have become pr practitioners of what we call evidence-based medicine, um, which is um, a paradigm which, which bases our um, ideas about medicine in um, epidemiologic study, essentially, right? So it's no longer uh, sufficient to just say, hey, there's a mechanism at play that means that this treatment should work. We have to prove it by doing very high quality epidemiologic studies, double blinded, randomized, controlled, multi-center studies, which essentially try to eliminate bias uh, from looking at the effect of an intervention. Um, and so I think, you know, particularly physicians that have been recently trained, if they apply that lens um, to looking at the evidence around uh, radiation and its health effects um, are very convincible. Um, so, you know, to sum it up, the answer would be yes, there's, there's a lot of fear around radiation within the medical community. 
um, despite us being, you know, the major driver of, um, you know, artificial radiation exposure. Um, but I think it's something that's, uh, you know, that, that physicians are very convincible on if, if, uh, if they're educated. And again, we just, we just don't receive enough of that education in our formal training. Do most doctors have a positive or negative view of nuclear power that you've met? Um, that's a, a difficult question. Like I haven't surveyed them. I mean, certainly the fact that there are, you know, two large anti-nuclear organizations. And again, these organizations uh, were founded based upon the horror and fear at, um, at you know, the prospect of basically humanity being wiped out by this, you know, incredibly destructive technology that we created. You know, these groups have something like 20, 30,000 members. So that's certainly you know, and they tend towards anti-nuclear, anti-nuclear energy activism as well. So, I mean, that's, that's a statement in and of itself. Um, I haven't formally surveyed the medical community. That'd be a really interesting thing to do. Um, you know, but I, you know, I would say that, um, you know, the, it's always the kind of the dog that barks the loudest that kind of can give you a, maybe a false sense of things. Um, that's true. It's, it's not that, you know, you know, I've just started to recruit and organize um, amongst uh, physicians who are pro-nuclear um, and it's uh, let me tell you it's I mean it's you know building those networks is not easy um, you know and again in the in the 60s and 70s the, the again talking about social determinants of health I mean what could you imagine more than the ever-present fear of nuclear weapons based annihilation of the human race I mean that was an absolutely terrifying and very real prospect and deeply deeply psychologically scarring I mean you know, I, I'm not sure, um, you know, your guy's age, but I, you know, I, I spent my conscious life largely outside of the, the, the threat of, of nuclear war between the, the two great powers the Soviet Union fell when I was eight years old. So I wasn't really conscious of that. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, in, in the 50s and 60s, I mean, there were these huge kind of civil defense drills uh, in the U.S. where, um, you know, there would be air raid sirens that were sounded in large cities and people would have to sort of seek shelter and there would be calculations about how many people would have died, you know, based upon how well the population responded. I mean, these were deeply, deeply scarring. You can imagine growing up as a kid in that in that time um, and how that would potentially lead you to to, uh, you know, to fear everything nuclear. Um, and the sort of, you know, the, this, this dual use technology, right? I mean, every, every technology is dual use, um, you know, just the Iron Age led to, you know, agricultural implements, which fed people and they led to weapons, which harmed people, right? So um, we need to look at technology within that light. But there's, there's a, you know, I want to say that I have enormous compassion for, uh, you know, physicians who are anti-nuclear because I understand that, especially of those of that generation, the kind of baby boomer generation, because of the kind of trauma that they that they grew up with, um, and it's it's very natural um, to to have those emotions about nuclear energy, and you know, these physician groups did um, campaign. Um, and successfully convinced uh, leaders like JFK to sign on to the partial test ban. You know, unfortunately, the way they did this was through um, hyping radiophobic concerns. Um, you know, there was a, a big study, um, I believe, in the in the fifties, um, where they sort of did a tooth fairy experiment and, and uh, sampled you know hundreds of thousands of, of baby teeth from children, and they found. Uh, isotopic contamination from nuclear weapons in you know the teeth of all of these children, which is that sounds awful, right? And that was again part of what motivated JFK into the the partial weapons testing ban. You know the health impacts of of that strontium ninety in those teeth is nothing, but trying to convince people that that it's not is is a very difficult proposition because you sound like an accomplice to the uh, you know weapons testing industry. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's a very difficult sort of situation to navigate. Um, but again, I think with concerns about climate now and with the emerging science around, um, you know, the incredible harms of air pollution, uh, physicians are weighing those relative risks um, and seeing very clearly that that comes down on the side of, of nuclear energy being uh, of tremendous uh, benefit to, to humanity and, and really an important tool at combating those upstream health impacts. Yeah, because of the, the bomb for today's people is not climate change. So now it's kind of putting things in the right perspective. But uh, but right. but yeah, let's uh, well, let's get more into like uh, about how we understand radiation, uh, Kobe. 
So yeah, like we we know that there's problems with linear no thresholds, uh, and so I'm just curious, like what's the current state of evidence regarding um, risk from radiation, and is there a better dose response model we could be using? Oh, and explain to uh, our listeners what is meant by no, linear no threshold model. Sure, sure. I mean, so the linear no threshold model um, basically states that there is no safe dose of radiation, that um, the harmful effects of radiation can be traced in a linear model from very high doses to, you know, absolutely trivial doses or, you know, almost undetectable doses um, such that, um, again, that there's no safe dose, that there's the potential that even an ultra low dose of radiation, if, if a large enough population is exposed, is going to cause harms. And so, you know, to, to sort of try and explain that a little bit, um, some good analogies I've heard is that, you know, if you jump off of a 100 foot cliff, it's probably going to kill you, right? Yeah. You may survive with uh, incredibly serious injuries, but if you um, jump off of a one foot ledge a hundred times, um, that's not going to kill you or fracture your bones, right? Um, you know, similarly, you know, there's this concept within medical toxicology, which is ancient. I mean, it goes back to one of the sort of founders of, of medicine, not, not quite of Hippocrates era, but, you know, Paracelsus who said, basically all things are poison and, and the dose is what makes the poison, right? So I like this example. I, I had a patient once who um, had some psychiatric difficulties and he ended up drinking eight liters of water in under an hour, right? Um, and what that did, it's actually, I mean, it's pathophysiologically very interesting, but um, basically it diluted the osmolarity of his blood. And because the brain has a, a barrier around it, the blood brain barrier, the brain equi equilibrates much more slowly in terms of its osmolarity. And so all of this water in his blood sucked into his brain, which is obviously confined within your skull. And his brain started swelling, what's called cerebral edema. And his brain actually was swelling so much it was threatening to try and leave the confined space of his skull by moving into his spinal canal and crushing, you know, what we call sort of the reptile brain, which is responsible for just the most basic functions that we have, like breathing. Um, and so, you know, he required intensive care um, treatments in order to pull this water out um, and change the osmolarity of his blood. Um, you know, so it, that was eight liters in an hour, right? The, the linear no threshold makes no distinction about the rate of, of the, the dose that you get um, and cumulative dose. So, I mean, if we apply that to the water model, um, you know, the average person probably, if you, if you follow what Lululemon says, you should probably drink like two liters of water per day. <laughs> it's probably excessive, but you know, that would suggest that if eight liters in an hour um, is basically fatal, then you know one in four people should die from drinking two liters of water. And obviously that's a totally preposterous proposition. Um, but radiation, again, because of, of this deep psychological trauma of nuclear weapons, um, you know, lives in its own kind of distinction as, you know, as a basis within this precautionary principle. And that's what the LNT really is. It's an expression of that precautionary principle. Um, so it's, it's a highly flawed model. It's, it's not really based in sound um, observational data, um, but it's used as, as a, you know, there is a consensus. Uh, I wouldn't say there's a scientific consensus around its validity, but there's a scientific consensus around, you know, that we should apply this uh, in radiation protection. Because, I mean, it sounds good, right? I mean, what if we could regulate all toxins this way and, and really reduce the amount of pollution in our environment? But I think as we'll explore you know, later in this interview, there's major, major implications to regulating um, potential toxins down to absolutely insignificant levels in terms of what that does um, to, uh, you know, things like doctor's tolerance to administer, you know, very important diagnostic imaging tests or the potential of nuclear energy to replace coal, for instance, um, whose health benefits are just absolutely enormous. Um, so it's led to this very, um, you know, myopic view of one risk um, at the expense of kind of all others. Um, and, and really, you know, if you look at the logic of it, as I tried to explain with that, that water, or that jumping uh, example, it just, it really defies reason. And it's, it's really interesting that, you know, there's this whole field of um, radiation protection that, that really uses this as their model. Um, and these are, you know, incredibly smart people who have, you know, a, a ton of expertise in the field. And I think if you talk to them privately, a lot of them will say, yeah, well, this doesn't really make sense. But, 
um, there's an industry around it, um, and it's it's the standard, and it's it's very hard to kind of overturn um, as a you know as a um, as a paradigm. Just the entrenched thinking of the day. And I mean, what's, what's interesting? Is, yeah, if you look into the the history of how it came about, um, I mean. Our, our attitudes around radiation have shifted dramatically over time, right? You know, pre-nuclear weapons, um, we weren't very scared of radiation. Um, and, you know, there were people that were exposed to very high doses and suffered the consequences, right? Like Mary Curie uh, died of aplastic anemia. Her bone marrow just gave out. It's interesting that that happened in her 60s after a lifetime of, you know, basically waiting and radioactivity. I believe she had a necklace um, with radium in it that was just kind of on her chest constantly <laughs> for years, right? I mean, wow. it goes to show that radiation is a relatively very, very weak um, toxin in terms of being carcinogenic. Um, but certainly, you know, the radium dial painter girls that were, you know, painting radium onto watches so they glow in the dark um, and were licking their brushes, you know, if they got very, very high doses, their jaws would fall apart. And, you know, so there we certainly have ample evidence and, and there began to be a concern around very, very high doses. But, you know, the dose thresholds that were set, um, you know, in the 20s and 30s were very high, right? I mean, it was two millisieverts per day, um, which is basically your background radiation dose for a year. Um, and, you know, really, there it's very hard to show strong effects of that, um, even those extremely high doses. Um, but, you know, the reduction of that by tenfold is something that I'd support. That's still, you know, a, a dose at which we have seen increased uh, cancer risks and, and shortening of lifespans potentially by small amounts, right? I mean, atomic bomb survivors who got these kind of large doses, you know, 100 to 500 millisieverts, you know, their lifespan was maybe shortened by several months on average, right? So, um, you know, a very, very weak toxinogen. But, you know, another basis upon which um, this, this theory is based is, you know, the understanding of DNA when it was discovered or the assumptions that were made about it were that this was a structure that was extremely fragile, right? There was no understanding when it was first discovered of all of the repair mechanisms that exist, for instance. Right. And so something that I find interesting is, you know, we talk about, you know, single and double strand breaks, right? So when, when DNA is, is broken by whatever chemical stressors, mostly it's, it's uh, you know, reactive oxygen species just from being aerobic creatures that use oxygen, right? And, and oxidative metabolism. So, you know, there is literally hundreds of thousands to millions in, of, of single strand DNA breaks every day in the average cell, right? So you can just get the scale at which our cells are constantly repairing themselves, right? Um, it's the double-stranded breaks that are, are more concerning in terms of being harder to repair, but still there's probably 10 to 50 of those per day um, in your cells. And the rate of that being caused by background radiation versus, you know, um, uh, uh, background, sorry, of, of being caused by aerobic metabolism versus uh, background radiation is something like 1,000 to 1. Right. So for every thousand double stranded DNA breaks that are caused just by, you know, being a creature with aerobic metabolism, there's one caused by background radiation. So, you know, there's just been a real development in our understanding of the molecular mechanisms that repair DNA. And that has not caught up to, you know, these uh, radiation protection um, guidelines, which are based in a paradigm from the 1950s. So how would we update radiation protection guidelines if, uh, if we want to go with more of an evidence-based approach to that? That's a million dollar question, my friend. Um, <laughs> like I said, I mean, there's a whole uh, like numbers of fields of studies. There's, you know, whole um, sectors of the economy which are, are based in, in this model. Um, you know, I've heard that for, for these kind of the scale of, uh, of dogma to change, like people literally need to pass away and a new generation needs to be born that's open minded. Right. What and my dad says evidence. that's a bit of a dark look on things. But, um, you know, I'm not terribly hopeful. It's it's a huge uphill battle. Um, and again, that's based in the deep psychology of fear that comes out of nuclear weapons. So I think that's easy to overturn. So on the activism side, I, I agree that that is certainly an uphill battle. Um, but like, say if you know we had a, a culture that was uh, ready to update their beliefs according to the science, like what um, what would a new model look like that is more in line with the evidence? Like, would it well, be a I mean, threshold or? Yeah, of course. I think that that applies to basically every other toxic, every other toxin that we're aware of. There is a threshold. 
Um, and so that threshold would probably be around 100 millisieverts based on data from the, the lifespan study, which looked at survivors of uh, the Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki bombings. Um, you know, where there was a, uh, a tiny increase. And that's really, you know, the threshold at which a detectable increase was found. You know, the problem with um, looking, and there's a lot of studies on, on low dose radiation, right? Um, and the, the problem with, so for instance, you know, one, one that, you know, cause I'm always trying to test my cognitive biases, right? So every month I try and sit down and read a few papers um, on say low dose radiation, because, you know, I have a strong set of beliefs now, but it's important to, to challenge those. And it's, you know, to go through that discomfort of, of reading something that, you know, really questions your core beliefs. It's, it's painful, but I think it's really important um, to be an honest kind of intellectual thinker. And so, you know, I read a study which was looking at um, CT scans on children and, and increases in cancer rates, right? And, you know, they were reporting something like, you know, an increase, I'd have to look at the study again to quote you the exact numbers, but something like, you know, an increase, you know, one cancer for every 9,000 childhood CT scans. And that's, you know, a small number, but I mean, you know, any kid getting cancer is absolutely terrifying. And as a physician who's right. kind of what we call like pulling the trigger on ordering a test, like there's, we're trained to have this kind of anxiety about like, uh, does this patient really need this diagnostic imaging test? Um, but if you look at, if you look at the study, I mean, the only way to, to really test that is to, you know, if we want to use the, 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 this kind of evidence-based medicine paradigm, which calls for, you know, a random assignment of an intervention to a, a, a test subject and a control is to just take kids off the street and administer CTs to them, right? The kids who are going to get CTs, there was an underlying reason that they went to get that study done, right? So there's this concept of reverse causality that maybe the population that got these C CTs had some underlying risk factors for cancer. And that's actually quite likely. And then if you look more deeply at the study, you know, kids who got CTs of areas um, of their body that were, you know, of say of, so, say of their abdomen, you know, the, the study was reporting that they had increased um, risk of getting a brain tumor. And there's just, there's no mechanism that would explain that. That makes zero sense in terms of, um, you know, where the radiation is focused in, in these types of CT scans. So, um, there's all sorts of kind of confounding variables when you're trying to find an effect um, that may or may not exist at an extremely, extremely low incidence. Um, so I'm actually forgetting what your question was in my little tangent there. But oh, well, yeah, um, we're going on trade-offs, yeah. and uh, so and like there's also uh, the concept of you know if, if you're having 9,000 CT scans, uh, how many lives is, are those scans saving uh, out of the 9,000, or at least improving? Oh, and absolutely. So, yeah. yeah, it's not like there isn't, you know, an, another cost to consider here. And let me let me tell you, like, this is something that I find very interesting about people's perceptions of the precautionary principle and, you know, risk from technology. Right. So when there is a direct individual benefit, people are not radiophobic. Right. So I'll have as an emergency physician, I see lots. I mean, kids fall down and hit their head all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. And parents are terrified that they've, you know, got bleeding on their brain. And I mean, that's something that we need to assess for. So literally every shift I work as an emergency physician, I'm, I'm assessing children who fall and hit their heads, right? Um, and I'll tell you that there is a large, maybe not quite the majority, but a large number of parents that, you know, are like demanding that I do a CT scan of their, of their child's brain, right? Um, which is a dose of around two millisieverts. That's the equivalent of your annual background radiation in two or three seconds, Right. Um, and so there's no radiophobia there. Right. But when when you talk about, hey, but there's a collective benefit, like this benefit to the commons, to, you know, the air that we all breathe of using nuclear energy, for instance. Um, and, you know, even in the setting of a catastrophic disaster, um, you know, like Chernobyl, where, you know, the surrounding populations were exposed to cesium, radioactive cesium afterwards, over a 20 year period, they got um, the equivalent of one full body CT scan worth of radiation from cesium, right? Um, again, not administered in a second or two, but administered over 20 years. Um, you know, you start to put that in perspective. And unfortunately, people just, they can't, they can't make that link or, you know, another example is, you know, people's uneasiness about genetic engineering and, you know, using genetic engineering to, to problem solve some of our agricultural challenges. There's an immense preoccupation and fear with that. Um, but, you know, the use of uh, genetic engineering and biotechnology to create insulin for diabetics, for instance, I mean, that's that's never questioned and rightly so. 
Um, and you could make yeah. that argument again with, you know, I, I just, I'm dwelling on this because I think it's really important, but you could make that argument with uh, antibiotics versus vaccines, right? So, you know, you, you get your poke and yes, you're, you're getting individual protection, but you're doing something um, collectively for your community. And it's really, I mean, it's probably the, the most important invention in human history in terms of improving quality of life is vaccination, right? Um, but uh, we, we have, you know, I have parents begging me for antibiotics for viral infections. And I mean, there's very real risks from antibiotics. You know, the, the rate of life-threatening allergic reactions is not insignificant. Um, yeah. So there's a real difficulty and maybe it's just because humans are a little bit, you know, selfish people. Um, or selfish organisms, but, you know, I think there's a real need, um, you know, you talked about how do we change some of these perceptions. I mean, some of it's just, uh, you know, effort needs to be put in to do that, right? And this idea of creating a culture of civic responsibility. I mean, I would love to see, and, and I think we're starting to see that with the COVID vaccine va vaccination programs. I mean, physicians on social media are all posting pictures of themselves getting the vaccine, trying to set, like, a, you know, act as a role model. I mean, Elvis Presley has a famous photo of him getting the polio vaccine. Like, we need kind of cultural influencers to to be examples and also to have that kind of messaging of I'm doing this for the community. Like, it should be a beautiful thing to get vaccinated. You should be proud of it. Um, so I think, you know, there's the opportunity to shift the culture on that sort of collective versus individual benefit, but it takes work. So you were Definitely. talking to, you, you talk a bit about you know, CT scans and MRI scans, um, you know, and you also kind of talked earlier about how, you know, the medical field administers a lot of uh, tests that uh, use ionizing radiation. Uh, could you tell us like on your daily, on a daily basis as an ER doc, like what are some of the myriad of necessary medical procedures that rely heavily on ionizing radiation and even radioactive isotopes? and when, if ever, do they become dangerous? Yeah, I mean, so I, I order a fair number of, of CT scans per shift. I got to say the Canadian medical practice is certainly to order less CT scans. Um, and, you know, that's partially because of, you know, various you know, medical legal environments. If you, you know, there's this huge fear of kind of missing something in the States and there's a huge availability of the technology. So, you know, there's a difference in, in the rates of CT scanning. And, you know, a lot of what we do is we, we are kind of resource stewards, um, you know, because there's a lot of unnecessary scanning that occurs. Right. Um, and I used to use fear of radiation as a tool to convince patients not to get an unnecessary test. Right. So that was kind of interesting. And I've, you know, it was actually hard to change my practice because it was highly effective. You know, if, if I had a patient in front of me and it was so clear that they didn't need this exam, um, that was a very effective tool saying, well, you know, there's a risk you could get cancer from this test. Um, and I've really changed my practice in that regard because it's just not intellectually honest based upon what I know now. You know, other things, um, there's other imaging tests um, that re that rely on on administering radioactive isotopes. Um, again, in emergency medicine, it's more about making diagnoses. Um, but for instance, for blood clots in the lung, um, we do uh, something called a, a ventilation circulation matching study where we'll administer isotopes through the blood and through breathing and see if they kind of match up in the lung. It's a little bit technical. You know, on the treatment side, um, this is stuff that happens outside of the emergency department, but certainly, right. um, you know, there's the field of radiation oncology where extremely high doses of radiation are administered. Um, and this is something that, again, really points away from the linear no threshold hypothesis because the kind of doses that are given uh, for instance, um, even for, say, breast cancer um, or, say, in the treatment of leukemia are, you know, if you added up the dose that's given over a period of, you know, weeks to months, it's, it would be universally fatal, right? You know, you start getting into 10 sieverts of uh, or 8 to 10 sieverts of uh, ionizing radiation exposure acutely all at once and no one survives that, right? But we give doses probably 10, 20 times as high as that, what we call fractionated. So we do it over time. You come in and you get, you know, four sieverts, you know, to, to focus on a particular body part. And then you come back two days later, you get that dose again and again, and you add that up and, and you end up killing the cancer because you've given these extraordinary high doses over time, right? The linear no threshold hypothesis would say that there's no distinction about, you know, when you get those doses, the rate at which you get those doses, which is clearly preposterous, right? Um, you know, my, my father has prostate cancer and there's a treatment, um, that is promising, which, which involves tagging, um, lutetium 177, which is a, an alpha emitter, a very 
a potent alpha emitter and you tag that to um, a tiny protein that's very specific for a receptor on that's expressed on prostate cancer cells. And so this isotope is carried to um, just the, the tissues that are that are cancerous and, you know, ionizes those those particular cells and kills them off. So there's, you know, potentially very targeted treatments. And and one of the, the, the probably the, the, the biggest example of that is the use of iodine 131 which is actually what caused cancers in a very specific population um, after Chernobyl, namely children whose thyroids were growing at that time, not adults, right, but, but children. Um, the treatment for thyroid cancer is actually the same isotope, iodine-131. Um, and that's really interesting because iodine is, is sucked up. There's no, there's no tissue in the body that concentrates an element as strongly as the thyroid gland. And so if you get a thyroid cancer and that thyroid cancer spreads throughout the body and you give iodine-131, that isotope is drawn up selectively just by that tissue. So we have incredibly effective treatments for thyroid cancer. I mean, so those are just some, some examples. Um, you know, other uh, examples of our use of, of radiation in healthcare, um, and a, a kind of proud Canadian example and a proud CANDU example. Uh, the CANDU is our, our uh, um, Canadian design um, for our nuclear reactors, is that we produce um, cobalt 60, um, which is a strong gamma uh, emitter and is used to, you know, the, the cobalt 60 that just one of our nuclear facilities in Canada produces sterilizes 40% of the world's single use. Uh, surgical instruments. I guess wow. that's incredible, right? And, you know, we produced enough cobalt 60 this year to sterilize 20 billion pieces of uh, personal protective equipment or 20 billion COVID swabs. So, I mean, it's it's absolutely incredible, the, the, the positive contributions of nuclear technology to health. Um, right. And I think it, I mean, it, 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 I don't just think, you know, it far, far, far outweighs even the worst nuclear accidents like Chernobyl. Right. And I, and I tell people, look, man-made radiation has saved so many more lives than it has ever taken. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. It's like, a, it's, a, it's a mirror, like unlocking this amazing technology just, it's so useful to us. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, and yet there's that threat of nuclear war, right? And, and that right. would drastically change the metric right. um, and that's why i mean that's that's a very again i'd really try and and you know if you're if you're um engaging in uh, arguments with anti-nuclear folks i think it's important to sort of um you know come at them with compassion and that's that's how i try to do that is to understand where their fears are coming from and you know address those deeper psychological drivers because that underlies so much of human decision making how we make our opinions right um, is not necessarily, you know, a sober assessment of the evidence, but rather what our psychological drivers are. And that's a very legitimate fear to have. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, how cobalt-60 is produced from, uh, you know, nuclear reactors in Canada. Um, can you tell us more about how, like, other special radioisotopes are, are produced in medicine? Is it all from, uh, you know, nuclear reactors for energy, or are there dedicated reactors? No, there's, there's certainly dedicated uh, medical isotope reactors all over the world, even in countries that outlaw um, nuclear reactors for energy production, like Australia. Australia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not, this is not, I'm, I'm kind of waiting a little bit far from my my area of expertise so I, I can't really go into a lot more detail on on this topic but um certainly you know as a canadian i'm, I'm super proud of our cobalt 60 production and yeah, well, the, know a little bit about that as a result the, the reason why i bring that up is that a lot of people don't realize that you you can say you don't want nuclear but if you don't have nuclear you don't have the ability to make these isotopes that are needed to save lives. And uh, so to say we need to just ban ban nuclear is almost sentencing people to death. So oh, it's, it's, it's completely insane. I mean, I had an argument recently with someone who was talking, you know, in those kind of terms or who just, you know, had a very, she uses the linear no threshold argument to, to say that, and again, it's this analogy of jumping off a hundred foot cliff versus, you know, taking a one centimeter step down, right? She, she says that, well, if you take the radiation released by Chernobyl and you, you know, apply that to, you know, 7 billion humans, then you're going to have a million cancers or something like that, right? It's an absolutely insane argument to make. 
Um, and I asked her, Hey, do you have smoke detectors in your house? (laughs) (laughs) And how do you, like, how do you compare the relative risk of dying in a fire, um, in your house because you don't have smoke detectors versus the, you know, the zero harm from, from having, you know, this americium isotope in your smoke detectors, which is absolutely relied upon, uh, for this incredible safety mechanism. I mean, I, I thought that was, uh, a good way to sort of put things into perspective and um she didn't get rid of her smoke detector so that was heartening (laughs) for sure i I don't know if i heard this somewhere i don't know if it was a rumor or not i probably shouldn't even spring it up if it might be a rumor but uh i heard somewhere that like michael douglas who was in uh the china syndrome he was like was treated for cancer i think with some isotopes uh and then he was like it kind of changed his mind a little bit on radiation and stuff, but I don't yeah. know. That's probably just a rumor. I don't want to say anything, but yeah, no, uh, I mean, I but hope. it's 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 interesting these uh the, these isotopes and you know how how in the future they can even you know you can tag them to antibodies or whatever and uh basically make a specific attack on a very specific type of cancer uh to basically nuke it so. Yeah, I mean, if we can, if we could do to uh, other cancers what we do to thyroid cancer, it'd be incredible. Of course, you know, cancer is uh, such a, you know, this it's this use of kind of one term to describe so many different disease processes, and you know, that elusive kind of cure for cancer is, uh, I think, will remain to be as elusive as, say, you know, for the nuclear nerds out there, uh, fusion <laughs> for serious energy production. <laughs> Um, it's just, it's not an unsolvable problem, but it's solved in, in tiny little steps along, all along the way. Um, and it's incredibly frustrating for, for physicians and, you know, for someone who has a member of my family who's, uh, who's dealing with cancer. What are some policy or procedural examples in medicine where patients are restricted from potentially beneficial treatments due to restrictions on radiation exposure? Um, you kind of talked about this with the MRIs again. Or like the CT scans. So, yeah, no, right? MRIs don't have ionizing radiation. But yeah, with C- I'd say that's the main thing is, is um, you know, that, that decision making that goes into when to order a CT scan. And um, I would say that for, for most physicians, that decision making does hinge on the LNT hypothesis and a fear of, of the use of ionizing radiation. Um, you know, I think the fear of missing something is, is higher for most physicians. So in general, um, we probably still over order CTs um, more on a resource utilization um, perspective than, um, than anything else. Um, But uh, you know, there's, there's uh, an example that uh, has come up recently and that's the idea of using um, radiation for the treatment of, uh, you know, severe COVID pneumonia, this kind of cytokine inflammatory uh, response that um, is responsible for probably most of the deaths related to, uh, COVID pneumonia, Um, you know, and prior to the use of antibiotics, um, radiation was used as a treatment for, especially for viral pneumonias. Um, The problem is that it's very, very hard uh, to to assess the quality of the evidence, or certainly, I mean, the quality of the evidence is very poor, I should say, it's it's quite easy to assess the quality, Um, which doesn't mean that it wasn't effective, it's just in terms of the standards of evidence that we apply now, um, most studies that were done, you know, even before the 1990s, uh, you know, the, the validity of their findings is highly questionable. Um, and so it's certainly a potentially promising treatment. Um, and there have been some series of patients with COVID pneumonia that were treated and improved, but, you know, we're trained to be highly um, critical and analytical thinkers in medicine and to, to really kind of poo poo a lot of things and say, you know, well, they might have just gotten better because that was the natural course of their disease and the radiation may, you know, there's such a temptation in terms of human logic to confuse correlation with causation. Um, But certainly I think that's promising and and there's um, certainly I think there should be research done on it and and there's an impediment to that research being done, which is, which is radiophobia. Um, So I think that would be, um, you know, a very uh, recent and compelling example of where fear of radiation may be impacting. Uh, medical care and and resulting in in people not getting the maximum benefit, but again, it's an experimental treatment, um, so it's it's a you know it's not as as cut and dry as as some uh, pro nuclear advocates uh, might paint it as being. I mean, if I were dying, I would definitely try to do something. You know, 
Yep. No, I'm in the same boat. I would uh, I'd give it a shot for sure. And that's, I mean, that's what we do with uh, clinical trials for cancer, right? If you have a disease that's looking like it's going to be universally fatal, then you enter into clinical trials and you volunteer to uh, maybe be a part of a discovery of a new treatment or treatment protocol, um, even though it entails risk because it hasn't been done before. Yeah, for sure. And so, um, like some of those like widely, uh, like largest studies on uh, radiation exposure in dealing with nuclear accidents. Um, we have the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, um, UNESCO. Uh, and do you think um, they did a good job accurately reporting the public health outcomes of both Chernobyl uh, and the Fukushima meltdown events? Yeah, so I think this this gets back to this theme of the scientific consensus, right? Particularly when you compare um, the UN SEAR reports to um, those of, you know, these alternative reports um, that have come out and which really the public um, makes uh, most of their assumptions based off of um, these alternative reports, right? So the UN SEAR reports, um, the, the Chernobyl Forum report, for instance, this was, you know, around 100 experts from... Uh, you know, and these are the most respected experts, um, you know, scientists who are published in the major peer reviewed journals. Um, so they're drawn from the three affected countries, uh, you know, Russia, Belarus and Ukraine and eight UN agencies, including the World Health Organization, you know, the Food and Agricultural Organization um, and, and UNSCR amongst others. Right. Um, and they're, you know, they're using the best methodology. You know, I was talking with Dr. Geraldine Thomas, who's the uh, director of the Chernobyl Tissue Bank, and she was, you know, describing some of these uh, consensus, uh, uh, you know, drafting of these consensus documents. And I mean, these scientists are debating this material, you know, up until all hours of the night, day after day after day to come up with, you know, the absolute highest quality evidence. Um, and of course, in this, in the setting of Chernobyl, um, we know there were 28 deaths from acute radiation sickness um, that occurred within the first three months of the accident amongst uh, something like 130 people who, who you know, got acute radiation sickness. Um, you know, and there's been, uh, up, I think the, the, the Chernobyl Forum report was published in around 2008. There were, at that point, 19 initial, additional deaths in that group uh, of the most highly exposed patients. But what's interesting is most of them were not caused by anything that could be related to radiation. I mean, car accidents, for instance, or cirrhosis of the liver from alcoholism. Yeah. Um, you know, and then the other findings were that there's been an additional 6,000 thyroid cancers. And I mean, that's a real tragedy. Um, you know, it has to do a lot with, I mean, A, the reactor design, you know, the fact that Chernobyl was a graphite moderated reactor and actually caught on fire and that that fire burned for 10 days and, you know, carried all these isotopes around, but also that the, uh, you know, the food chain wasn't disrupted for, um, you know, children that were drinking milk from cows that were sort of bioconcentrating this iodine in their milk. Um, luckily, thyroid cancer is, you know, probably one of the most treatable cancers there are. So only 15 fatal cases at that point. So we're talking about, you know, documented deaths from Chernobyl of around 60. Now, when you look at, you know, the alternative reports, what's very interesting is um, they were almost all commissioned by green parties or Greenpeace. So you have, you know, the other report on Chernobyl, the torch report. Um, this was actually commissioned by the European Green Party in response to um, the UN SEAR report. Um, you know, this was two scientists, not hundreds of scientists. Um, and, you know, their main criticism was, you know, that the LNT was not being replied, uh, applied to countries that had had, you know, far lower dose rates. Um, and therefore that, you know, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands more people were um, killed by Chernobyl. Right. So, you know, it's just it's the, these other reports are not based on the scientific consensus. They're, you know, um, funded and uh, sponsored you know, by very ideologically driven entities who are seeking an answer that's congruent with their biases, right? So this is just not good science. Um, and I mean, I could go through some of the other reports, but they're very similar in terms of, um, you know, there was a, a Russian report. Um, the author was the uh, founder of Greenpeace in Russia, for instance. Um, and his, his report, although, you know, published in the National Academy of Sciences, was not endorsed by them whatsoever, was not peer reviewed and has been just decimated by experts in the field. So unfortunately, the public tends to uh, cling to those kind of numbers. And you can remember the HBO series on Chernobyl. I think they quoted something like 200,000 deaths based off of a Greenpeace quote unquote study. 
Um, so, you know, there's uh, a real problem here that in, in terms of science communication that the actual scientific consensus has not been well communicated to the public. And yeah. the, person, the person who actually did the HBO show, uh, his name's Craig Mazin. He mm -hmm. is outwardly pro-nuclear, by the way, just so people know. But, uh, but yeah. those scary numbers grab eyeballs, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's just really unfortunate that, uh, you know, in his research for the show, um, he didn't consult more widely with radiation experts. Um, and maybe, you know, the, the reasons for that are, are hard to understand. But certainly, you know, it's a more dramatic story if, if uh, it's it's told with, uh, you know, these kind of these stories and numbers. Right. I mean, the, the idea of the bridge of death, which is featured prominently in the movie, has has no basis um, in, in science. Um, so, yeah, it's it's unfortunate yeah. that if he is a supporter of nuclear energy, that he did, I think, so much harm to uh, to this uh, technology, which, again, has the potential to save, you know, millions of lives through averting air pollution and and, uh, you know, combating climate change. Yeah, we, we talked about Chernobyl. Um, what what have you read about Fukushima? Uh, are you at all worried about what happened at Fukushima for public health? I haven't studied Fukushima as closely, um, yeah. but no, I mean, particularly, you know, the, the, the only outside of acute radiation sickness at Chernobyl, which no one has received a, signif uh, a dose um, uh, high enough at Fukushima to cause uh, acute radiation sickness, um, you know, the only, again, the only demonstrable um, harm was from the release of iodine-131 at Chernobyl, right? Um, much higher amounts of iodine-131 were released. Um, the food chain was not uh, disrupted. Um, children were not protected. And, and at Fukushima, you know, a, a far smaller amount of iodine-131 was released. Um, you know, the food chain was disrupted. And so really, we don't expect to see any increase in, um, in the cancer risk um, as a result of Fukushima, it's just that the doses were not high enough. Um, radiation, you know, nuclear accidents are sources, um, especially to the public, of very low dose rates of, of radiation are, are not expected um, to raise cancer incident. Yeah, Ben, just to remind listeners, Chernobyl-like reactors don't really exist today. And look at what it took to take out Fukushima. And based on even what happened at Fukushima, it released a small, small amount. So it just kind of goes to show that even when things go wrong, this technology is, or at least the modern way to run reactors today, is still relatively very, I mean, not relatively, completely, like, safe, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think what's really interesting about radiation and radiophobia, like another another feature here is that we can't sense radiation, right? We can't smell it, we can't taste it, we can't see mm -hmm. it. Um, and, you know, that which we cannot sense, um, it's very easy for our imaginations to run wild. And, and the analogy I'd use here is, you know, in the early days of COVID, um, like when, when countries like Italy and Iran were blowing up, um, I remember in our emergency department, you know, actually, you know, earlier on when it was just confined to China, um, you know, the nurses all started wearing masks and none of the doctors did. And we really didn't, we weren't that worried. And then when Italy and Iran started blowing up, you know, and we were just feeling like there was this impending tidal wave that was about to roll over us, you know, fear really just started to mount. And, you know, we, you know, you can't see the virus, you can't taste the virus. Um, and it was, you know, that was really burdensome on our staff and on me personally. Um, the thing about radiation though, is we can't sense it with our own sensory organs, but with, you know, the devices, that we've created to detect it, we can detect uh, radiation down to the decay of a single atom, right? So um, we have the ability to measure this uh, like just with incredible sensitivity in a way that we don't for other toxins, um, you know, like particulate matter 2.5, which is probably, um, you know, the, the single substance of greatest concern to human health on the planet. Um, so, you know, that's it's, it's this, this paradox and uh, it makes uh, fear of radiation all the more potent. For sure. For sure. You you touched upon that uh, on the pollution issue, Colby. Um, so, yeah, like the uh, when it comes to incidences of respiratory disease attributed to air pollution, like uh, what demographics are affected the most? Yeah, I mean, so air pollution is an interesting one. Uh, you know, I used to think as well that it was, you know, just... Oh, shoot. I, we did the wrong question. I'm <laughs> sorry, guys. Don't worry. So, so 
Hey, this was my, it's supposed to be my question. I apologize, <laughs> listeners. Uh, so the world, uh, when talking about air pollution, uh, sure. the World Health Organization, World Health Organization reports that roughly seven million people die each year from particulate matter pollution, most of which is attributed to biomass and fossil fuel burning. In your experience, how prevalent is such knowledge? Uh, how prevalent is such knowledge within the medical community? Uh, I wouldn't say it's uh, sort of top of our concern, um, and it really should be. Um, you know, you mentioned they've actually the WHO has up up revised their estimate of, of the burden of uh, air pollution on on uh, on mortality to eight point eight million per year. Um, you know, and so. In India, that's uh, 2.2 million per year dying from air pollution. In China, about half a million. Um, air pollution, um, in terms of shortening lifespans, it has an uh, impact that's greater on a worldwide basis that's greater than smoking, greater than alcohol, greater than unsafe water, greater than car accidents, greater than HIV and AIDS, greater than malaria, right? So it takes about two years off of average lifespan across the world. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it it should be absolutely top of our, our concern. And I I don't know, like I I love kind of archaeology and I love um, thinking back in deep time about the human species and, and why we make the decisions we do and why we fear the things we do. I mean, we co-evolved with fire. Like Homo sapiens would not exist if earlier hominids had not domesticated fire. Um, so it's something that you know is highly dangerous and risky. Um, technology, but it's just kind of fundamental to our existence. And so, you know, it's as I learn more about the health risks um, or the the lack thereof in terms of low dose radiation and the relative risks compared to other problems in the world, you know, I realized that I'd spent a lot of time around campfires in my life. Um, you know, I, I lived in the Yukon for a number of years and lived in the backcountry for for quite a while and cooked over campfires and. You know, I probably smoked the equivalent of, you know, five or six years worth of cigarettes. Um, and now when I, you know, when I'm in the city and I see someone with a, you know, I see smoke coming out of someone's chimney because they have a fireplace at home. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you know, it's it, that's that's like having a, a an 18 wheeler idling outside of your house in terms of the equivalence of, of the air pollution. Um, but we we have such a tolerance for it because it seems natural. Right. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, it should be for physicians. It should be a major issue in my my home province here of Ontario. We phased out coal um, through um, turning on six nuclear reactors, um, replacing ninety percent of the energy that was needed to get rid of coal. And um, you know, it, it had a dramatic impact on health. Um, I see far fewer cases of you know severe asthma uh, in my in my practice. Um, but of course, you know, air pollution. It's it's not just about the respiratory system. Certainly. Uh, you know, we can document permanent lung function changes in, in 50% of children in Delhi as a result of air pollution, right? Just if you uh -huh. actually look at pulmonary function tests, major, major impacts that will stop them for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, but, you know, these per this particulate matter crosses um, into, the, into the cardiovascular system and it's distributed throughout the whole body. So vascular disease like heart attacks, strokes, um, you know, a large burden of that is caused by air pollution and even, you know, reproductive issues like preterm birth, the rates of preterm birth in areas with heavy air pollution are dramatically higher. Um, and you can think of that as a vascular disease again, because of the placental interface. Um, so it's just drastically underestimated in terms of dealing with, you know, the, uh, social determinants of health and upstream medicine, air pollution should be an absolute top priority and unfortunately it's not. I mean, we've made major, major gains, um, you know, through say the, uh, the use of scrubbers on coal power plants or catalytic converters on cars, but you know, there's a much better way. And this is something where, you know, I still wouldn't argue that there's a linear no threshold and that, you know, single, um, particulate uh, matter is, is going to induce a cancer or another disease process, but we should be regulating air pollution far, far, far more aggressively in terms of, in terms of its impacts on human health. Yeah. I mean, uh, even, even people who don't want to, you know, acknowledge, you know, the climate issue, uh, you can, you can win on an argument for nuclear just on the air pollution alone, you know, 
You should be able to. Yeah, definitely. There's a, uh, a great um, blog called Thoughtscapism. And I, I never remember how to pronounce this woman's last name, but Lita Rush Hume or something. She's Finnish. Um, and she did a really interesting analysis on, um, you know, the merits of evacuating the Fukushima exclusion zone. And she was comparing basically the risk of premature mortality from living in some of the off limits, uh, off limit areas of Fukushima to moving to Tokyo. And, you know, the increased risk of premature mortality from living in the off limit areas in Fukushima was around 1%. And you jump to about 5% in some of the most polluted areas of Tokyo. Um, 9% when you get to Seoul, Korea and 15% if you move to Shanghai. Right. So again, there's just this enormous failure of uh, a sober analysis of relative risks when it comes to understanding the, the relative impacts of, of radiation and uh, to air pollution, for instance. And the benefits of nuclear energy are just so demonstrably there. Um, I believe there was a study done uh, which uh, posited that there's uh, 1.8 million lives have been saved so far from nuclear energy as a result of displacing uh, fossil fuel burning. Um, and yeah, I, and that's I, by NASA too. Yeah. James Hansen, James Hansen, yeah. our boy, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. And there is quite a sobering uh, uh, map out there uh, where it shows like a world map side by side and it's relative risk of, uh, you know, shortened life from air pollution. And it's like, you know, you see the, 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 um, uh, the color labels like all over the world and you know it's it's bad in cities and it's uh it's it's very clear you know that this is affecting everybody and then it shows you the relative risk of reduced life expectancy due to radiation and it's like a tiny amount of like uh, you know like the lowest risk category and like the the smallest area over chernobyl and fukushima yeah. and it really goes to show like where how, how backwards our priorities are Absolutely. And I mean, this does speak to the responsibility as well for the anti-nuclear movement. Um, for instance, Ralph Nader, who's a, you know, a champion of consumer rights in the United States and did a lot to improve automobile safety by going after the big auto companies uh, around seatbelts and, and other safety issues. Um, he was He's a famous anti-nuclear activist and he was very involved in um, Ohio, when in the 1970s, air pollution was becoming, you know, a really critical issue. Um, you know, he campaigned actively there to prevent the building of, I think it was four nuclear power plants in order to replace coal plants. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, very effective. Wow. Yeah, very effective. Um, one of these plants was, I think, close to 97% finished. Um, they were, of course, uh, coal plants were built instead of, of these uh, nuclear plants. And uh, the protesters just disappeared when, when it was decided to build coal plants. Yeah. Right? So, you know, there is, I don't like sort of talking about having blood on your hands, but, um, you know, in this instance, that's, that's a very serious accusation, and particularly for someone like Ralph Nader, who I think would say that auto companies have blood on their hands for, um, you know, sidestepping regulation or for, um, you know, making those asinine calculations around like, what, what's it going to cost us to do a recall on this unsafe automobile versus the number of lives saved and getting sued by them, you know, by the victims yeah. of, of car accidents, right? Like he would say they have blood on their hands. And so it's hard to not see that in the setting of uh, Ohio, where, you know, he was indirectly responsible for uh, coal being built instead of nuclear and the resulting air pollution impacts, you know, <laughs> definitely killed people. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, on the physician front, just circling back there, I mean, you know, what's clear when you look at the, um, you, the, the scientifically valid reports on Chernobyl and Fukushima is that the major health impacts were those caused by evacuation and dislocation of people from their communities and the kind of stigma that people faced, you know, as if radiation was a contagious disease, right? I mean, um, you know, in, the, in terms of the, the atomic bomb survivors in, uh, in Japan, there was an enormous amounts of social stigma. There's this kind of fatalism that, hey, I'm going to die anyway of cancer because I was exposed to Chernobyl fallout, so I might as well just drink heavy. Um, you know, you're, you're physically separated from the place you grew up. Those have enormous uh, psychological stress and health impacts. 
And so, you know, fear mongers like Helen Caldicott, who claim that, you know, more people ha will die as a result of Chernobyl than died from the Black Plague, for God's sakes, um, you know, which wiped out something like, I think it's 20% of humanity. Um, you know, these kind of statements have very, very real impacts on, on human health as a result of uh, people's uh, fear around even things like medical imaging, but, you know, particularly around yeah. issues like nuclear accidents. Uh, which have a, you know, in the case of Fukushima, really no impact on human health. But, you know, the, the botched evacuation killed over a thousand people. And the ongoing stress and health impacts just of not being allowed to return to their homes has definitely resulted in serious morbidity and mortality. So, you know, the fear mongers uh, need to really think carefully about the impacts of, you know, I guess their well-meaning activism. Right. It's tragic. Yeah, I was I was also going to say, like, what humans are learning to get good at is minimizing risk. And that is uh, an important thing to have in mind. And in order to do that, we need to have the right information. So uh, it's always good to second guess what your preconceived notions are and, you know, like give yourself like you were saying, you 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 try to do some research to um uh, to acknowledge your own biases. And I think that's very important, uh, especially now in the age of such misinformation, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's just, it's, I'd say that, you know, the two of our like fundamental issues in terms of, you know, making errors of cognition are, you know, confusing correlation with causation and, you know, relative risk assessment. And really, I think the relative risk assessment just so deeply shapes our, our errors in decision making. Um, and when you think about it, I mean, I'm a dreamer. I, I imagine what what could be possible if we really dramatically upscaled nuclear energy and the impacts that could have on climate change and the very real impacts that could have on air pollution. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a real tragedy that uh, we've made the decisions that we've made and that we've um, almost regulated nuclear energy out of existence over these, um, you know, just grossly displaced uh, fears. It's, you know, the precautionary principle gone wild. And, you know, there's a really interesting, I think it was published in Spiked or maybe Wired magazine, but it talked about um, the concept of the precautionary principle. And it just listed a number of technologies that would not have been allowed if we were to apply the same kind of idea of the precautionary principle, which has become so prominent in the late 90s and early 2000s. And, you know, what's listed is things like air travel, antibiotics, aspirin, biotechnology, blood transfusions, oral contraceptive pills, electricity, organ plants, they do, and organ transplants. They do a kind of A to Z list of all the technologies that would not have been allowed to sort of, to sort of take off as a result of the precautionary principle run wild. Um, and we really need to consider that, particularly in the setting of nuclear energy, where, again, the, the benefits so clearly outweigh the harms. Um, so, so, yeah, we were talking about how their air pollution is just uh, having all these really tragic health impacts for, you know, you mentioned, you know, children in Delhi. And uh, so, uh, like, would you say that nuclear power is probably one of the most important ways to uh, deliver environmental justice and, uh, you know, ensure a healthy living environment for underprivileged groups and, um, you know, developing uh, nations and, and around the world. That sounds like a bit of a leading question, Colby. <laughs> <laughs> but, I didn't write uh, it. <laughs> the answer to that would be yes, an enthusiastic yes. I think nuclear mm -hmm. wins on, on uh, every metric in that regard. Uh, on the air pollution and on the climate change front. It's a, it's a no brainer, um, but we are fighting an uphill battle against a lot of uh, cognitive biases and against the legacy of the fear of nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, you know, that's, I like backing an underdog and I like, you know, pursuing the truth at sort of whatever the cost is. And it's really kind of what I'm devoting my life to at this point um, beyond raising my son and uh, you know, my family obligations. But um, yeah, and, it, and, it's going to be a tough challenge, but. And it's such a strong, like, if you want to kind of start getting people more open to the idea of nuclear, talking about social justice, especially on more left-leaning crowds, uh, is, is super important. And it's, it's, 
uh, like, or in, I should say environmental justice, uh, yeah. because there is an argument to be made that, you know, it does disproportionately affect the poor, especially air pollution. And, and, and nuclear is a way to give poor people unfathomable amounts of electricity with zero, zero air pollution. So mm. it's, it, it's good. It, it, it's, it's a justice issue. It, it, and uh, an example I, I like to talk about is uh, the United States uh, Senator Cory Booker. I don't know if you know yeah. much about him, but, but he, he looked into, he, clearly this guy likes to do his homework and looked into, you know, how asthma disproportionately affects the African-American community. And he looked up at solutions for it. And now he's an ardent nuclear supporter, which is kind of cool. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a very logical conclusion. I mean, we talked a bit about the HBO Chernobyl show, um, and the impacts that has on the public perception of nuclear. And I, I really think the Simpsons was another major one there more in terms of, um, the politics of nuclear, right? Um, because it, you know, it portrays Mr. Burns, this kind of evil capitalist who's willing to cut all sorts of safety corners and, and put everyone's lives and health at risk. Um, and that's, I think really the dominant energy that most North Americans have, uh, and maybe more broadly across the world have of what the nuclear industry looks like. Um, but the reality is, especially outside of the U S, um, almost every nuclear energy program, uh, is a, you know, a, a publicly owned utility, um, run by the state in some way, shape or form, or, or by, you know, state corporations. Um, this is not, uh, generally speaking, an issue of kind of evil capitalists, uh, putting everyone's health at risk. Um, it's, you know, countries strategically investing in an energy source that, uh, provides an enormous uh, social and environmental benefit. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's very important to tailor your your uh, arguments to the people that you're speaking with. And so when I'm speaking with baby boomers who are um, carrying the psychological trauma of nuclear weapons, I'll try and, you know, engage them on, on that front. And when I talk to leftists, I, you know, I, I make these kind of arguments and issues around, um, you know, how nuclear uh, contributes to the commons and how, you know, renewables, for instance, kind of privatize the, the, the benefits, the profits and socialize the costs in terms of destabilizing our grids with intermittent power, which requires an enormous kind of grid infrastructure investments just to be able to tolerate uh, increasing penetrations of renewables. So there's, there's, you know, I, 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 there's lots of arguments um, and you need to, you need to sort of tailor those to your audience in order to be an effective advocate. Yeah. I, just in my experience, and I don't want to keep going on tangents, but in my experience, nuclear is, is that's why I'm addicted to the cause of nuclear, because you can persuade, there's so many good things about nuclear, you can get anybody on board. Like, like it's the one technology that could get capitalists and socialists not to fight. It's crazy. Yeah, no, and that's, that's an incredible thing. And, you know, Maddie Cizerwinski's, uh, campaign for a green nuclear deal really tries to build off that within the U.S. model because there is some degree of consensus between Republicans and Democrats that nuclear energy um, has a very important role to play in, uh, in dealing with climate change. Um, so there's the opportunity there. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly I never imagined in my you know, earlier activist days fighting for uh, refugee rights and refugee health care. Um, amongst a number of other uh, social causes uh, that I would one day predominantly be steering my activism around support for a technology. Like, it's just, it's really bizarre to me, but I can explain to you why. And I think, <laughs> I think that's what we've sort of done today uh, in one way, shape or form. It's, uh, I think, you know, with, in the context of climate change and air pollution, probably the, the most important uh, way that I can think of dedicating my efforts. I agree. It's a, it's a very worthy cause. <laughs> Definitely. Well, we've been talking for a while uh, and we're getting towards the end of our time. Uh, do you have anything else you wanted to say and where can listeners find you or learn more about you and your work? Okay. Yeah. I mean, so I have a number of uh, websites. Um, certainly there's uh, www.doctorsfornuclear.org. Um, I, uh, you know, and you can find me on Twitter as well, um, at, I'm going to forget the actual spelling here, but I think it's docs, doctors for nuclear one. Um, 
you know, I, I also have a, a podcast called the Decouple Podcast, um, where I uh, have had the great fortune of interviewing some really wonderful experts on a variety of domains, but including uh, Dr. Geraldine Thomas, uh, the director of the Chernobyl Tissue Bank. So if people were interested in the topics discussed today, she uh, does a much better job of uh, explaining some of the issues, particularly around Chernobyl and the, uh, the quality of the literature uh, regarding the health impacts. Um, those, is, I say, I'd say, were, were my main things. I, I uh, am involved in a number of other uh, activist ad, uh, adventures, but uh, on the Doctors for Nuclear front, that's that's kind of where I'd uh, direct people. If you are a physician or a healthcare worker, please uh, do get in touch with me through the website. You can you can contact me and send me an email there. I'm delighted to sort of sign more people up to the cause. Um, and yeah, I'm on Twitter as well. My main Twitter account is at Doctor underscore Kiefer. Kiefer spelled K E E F as in Fred E R. Great. Well, this has been really fun and informative. Um, thank you again for joining us for this. Yeah, no, yes. my yes, pleasure. Chris, thank you for sure. Yeah, my pleasure, guys. Thanks for doing what you do as well. It's uh, great to see some more uh, podcasts out there and, uh, you know, creating a bit of an ecosystem where we can tackle a variety of different topics. So thanks for doing what you guys do. Well, that was a great conversation with Dr. Chris Kiefer. We covered so many different topics and had some interesting tangents along the way. Yeah, that is what I love about the subject of nuclear power. It has so many implications in our lives. The health benefits of this technology are not stressed nearly enough, and it was good to learn about them in detail from a real doctor. Nuclear technologies are good for public health, not just in terms of clean air, but also providing medicines and medical diagnostic options we wouldn't otherwise have. Yeah, for sure. What I took away from this episode was the importance of doctors' voices in getting the general population to see how trustworthy and beneficial nuclear power actually is. It will take quite a bit to undo a lot of the irrational fear of radiation and the mistruths surrounding nuclear from the 70s and 80s. If we start having large portions of the medical community coming out and praising nuclear in line with scientific evidence, it could really get the attention of policymakers. Right now, nuclear power in the United States is in dire straits, with plant closure after closure after closure, and very few people are speaking up about it. There is so much clean energy on the line here. Hopefully, we can have physicians join panels before government officials to explain what we risk losing in terms of human health. It will take quite a shift in thinking, as historically medical professionals have had a negative view of the term nuclear since the threat of nuclear war on human life was incalculably grim. But nuclear power, on the other hand, should start to become a doctor's best friend to fight air pollution, similar to the way vaccines protect us from infectious disease. The more scientific experts we have on the side of nuclear power, which is backed up by very compelling evidence, the more the public will hopefully be open to reconsidering such a wonderful energy source. Absolutely. A great deal of nuclear advocacy focuses on the climate benefits, which are valid. But the fact that it has saved so many lives and could be saving millions more from air pollution, well we could be leading more advocacy with these points. The trade-off of misusing the precautionary principle is very real and certainly applies to nuclear technologies. We know nuclear energy can replace fossil fuels and save millions of lives in the process, which is why it's important to emphasize this when advocating for this technology. All these things are super important, and we hope listeners enjoyed the discussion this episode. This has been a doctor's case for nuclear power. We'd like to thank Dr. Chris Kiefer for joining us, and thanks for tuning in. If you like what you heard and want more content, you can support Americans for Nuclear Energy's Climate Fix podcast on a per episode basis with Patreon, link in the description. To support Americans for Nuclear Energy and our general mission, visit our website at www.americansfornuclearenergy.org. All words, again, that's www.americansfornuclearenergy.org. We have a link to donate with PayPal under the Mobilize page. You can also purchase some Americans for Nuclear Energy swag under our store page. This will really help us pay for the little things, especially online service fees, to keep our organization running. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Tumblr, and YouTube. Lastly, we really want your feedback. Let us know your thoughts, questions, and concerns. We have a message form on our website under the About section. Or you can email us directly at main at americansfornuclearenergy.org all words. Again, that's main at americansfornuclearenergy.org.
Thanks for tuning into this episode of Americans for Nuclear Energy's Climate Fix podcast. We'll see you next time. Edited and produced by Jonna Adams.